Do you find yourself intimidated by scientific names? Are you confused by the abbreviations and symbols? What about people's names that appear after scientific names? And why are some of them in parentheses? In this video, I'm going to break down the seemingly difficult system of scientific names and give you some real-life examples, so you will be able to confidently read and write scientific names yourself. I'm not going to talk about the history of binomial nomenclature, which is the official system used for naming organisms introduced by Carl Linnaeus, but rather dive straight into real examples, so it will help you in day-to-day -day life. Every organism has a formal name that's assigned by a scientist or multiple scientists that write up the scientific description of that organism. Using scientific names is really the only way how to unambiguously communicate about the organism since the common names are very region-dependent. Sometimes it might sound pretentious, but just look at these plants. I think that most of you would call them all a sunflower, when in fact these are all different species and even different genera, and there are hundreds more plants that look like a sunflower. That's why the use of scientific names is important, at least in certain situations. As you can imagine, there are certain standards, rules and recommendations that have to be followed when it comes to naming organisms. The rules and guidelines vary somewhat amongst different fields of biology, so there are multiple guidebooks that are often referred to simply as codes that scientists use for guidance when they're creating or choosing the name of an organism, but also when they need to resolve any confusion or apparent conflict. As a user of the scientific names, there is no need to know the rules of the codes. However, it's good to be aware of the fact that they exist, and that they vary slightly between different organisms. Let's dive straight into decoding some examples of the binomial scientific names. First, we have the common daisy, which many of you probably know from your lawn. Its scientific name is Bellis perennis. As I mentioned before, we use binomial naming system for the organisms, which means that their scientific name is composed of two parts. First, Bellis, is the generic name, and it shows us the genus that this species belongs to, in this case the genus Bellis. If you need a refresher on taxonomic hierarchy, I made a video about this topic that I'll link down in the description below. We can have many organisms belonging to one genus, and since they're closely related, they will look similar. In the case of Bellis, there are 14 different species. The second word stands for the species, and it is referred to as the specific epithet. This name, in combination with the genus name, creates a unique name batch for the species. You can use the genus name in isolation. For example, when you know what genus the organism belongs to, but you don't know about the species. Like in this case, where I took a photo of a plant, that based on its look, I'm sure belongs to the genus Gallium, but I don't see enough characters to be able to identify it to species. So I'll call it only Gallium, or especially in the written form, I would say Gallium Spa. The abbreviation is for species, and when it follows a generic name, it tells us that we don't have the species identified. It's possible, although not frequent, that the same genus name is used for organisms from different kingdoms. For example, the genus Iris represents a group of praying mantises, but also a group of well-known plants. It is recommended, though, when creating a new genus name, that we do not use the name that already exists in different kingdoms. While a genus name can be used in isolation, the species name has no meaning on its own. For example, the specific epithet Alba, is used for many different plants, animals, or even bacteria, so unless we see it in combination with a genus name, it doesn't represent any particular organism. And why are some species names, such as Alba, so popular? It is a general convention, although not a rule, to use names that are descriptive of the organism. Alba, in this case, means white in Latin, so it will clearly refer to the color of the organism. Because the scientific naming systems are based on Latin and Greek, and Latin and Greek have grammatical gender built in, the gender of these kinds of species names has to agree with the gender of the genus name. Even genus names from other languages have a gender. Names are not exclusively descriptive, like pilosa, meaning hairy, 
nigra meaning black, erecta meaning erect, etc. But they can also commemorate a person, for example someone who collected the first specimen or played an important role in studying the organism. One such example is the genus Banksia, which was named after the famous naturalist Joseph Banks, the first person who collected scientific specimens of these Australian plants. A place name, usually describing a location where the given species was found or where it naturally occurs, is also commonly used. Like the epithet in Escholtzia californica, commonly known as California poppy, which refers to its native ranch, California. Sometimes the names are a bit unfortunate though, like in this cockroach fiasco. German cockroach, Blatella germanica, is not native to Germany, as the name suggests, but rather to Southeast Asia. American cockroach, Periplaneta americana, is native to Africa. Australian cockroach, Periplaneta australasiae, is probably native to Africa and was actually introduced to Australia. The origin of oriental cockroach, Blata orientalis, is unknown, but it's either from Africa or southern Russia. All of these cockroaches, however, are now widely distributed as a result of human activity. To review, the scientific name consists of two parts, the genus name and the species name. And before we move on to what follows after the name, take a moment to look at some examples and notice the style the name is written in. Do you see what they all have in common? Scientific names are always written in italics and the genus name is always capitalized, while the species name always starts with a lower case letter. If you happen to handwrite a name, then you underline the words that should be in italics. When we go back to our example of Bellis Peranus, you see the italicized scientific name is followed by the letter L. This is the name, or in this case an abbreviation, of the author who described this species. In botany, it's common to use abbreviations for the names. And in fact, the abbreviations are standardized. So we can look up, for example in this case, that L stands for Linnaeus. In zoology, abbreviations are not normally used for scientific name authorship, so the name Linnaeus would be all spelled out. Sometimes there are multiple authors who describe the species, such as in these examples. But why are the author names sometimes put into parentheses? The author in parentheses is the one who originally described the species. However, it was later moved into a different genus by this author, whose name is in the second position. The original author is put into parentheses. This doesn't happen in zoology though, where the author who moved the species into a different genus is omitted from the authorship. So we went through the genus name, the species name and the authorship. But there is sometimes one more thing that follows. A year. The year tells us the year of publication of the original description. So if we look back at the previously mentioned mealworm beetle, Tenebrio molitor, we see that it was described by Linnaeus in a publication from 1758, which helps us locate that publication if needed. It helps further distinguish similar names, so it's very helpful especially when their year is used in scientific works. The genus name, species name, authorship and year of publication of the original description are usually all the necessary components for you to be able to read and understand a scientific name. However, there are some special symbols and abbreviations that you might come across. I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, although if it's something you're interested in, let me know in the comments below. I'm just going to mention two abbreviations and one symbol that you're quite likely to come across. First we have a symbol X, like in Citrus sinensis, the well-known sweet orange. The symbol X shows us it is an interspecific hybrid, meaning its parents are two different species of citrus. We read this as Citrus hybrid species sinensis. Subspecies, the rank below species, is found both in botany and zoology. It is the third name appearing in scientific names, and while in botany it is prefixed by the abbreviation, in zoology there is no prefix, so we get a trinomial scientific name. With genus first, species second and subspecies third. 
In botany, we also recognize varieties, which is yet another rank below species and subspecies. It is marked by this abbreviation after the species name and before the variety name. Varieties don't exist in zoology, so if you see a trinomial, you know it's a subspecies. Let's practice what we learned with some examples. This is an easy one. Bohinia, hybrid species Blakeana, was described by Dunn. Thanks to the author name, we can trace the publication with the original description, which is from 1908. Next, we have a beetle, Polyphila decimlineata. The fact that the author's name and their year are in parentheses means that it was later moved to its current genus, but it doesn't tell us by whom. Remember, in zoology, those authors are omitted from the authorship, so we don't see who moved it to the current genus. However, we can look up the original publication by, say, from 1823, to find out that the species was originally described in genus Melolonta. Mojavea confertiflora. Here we're dealing with the same case like the previous one. The author in the parentheses, Banth, is the one who originally described the species. But the second author, Jepson, moved it into its current genus, Mojavea. You see that as opposed to the zoology, both authors are mentioned. Darlingtonia californica. This is an easy example, as there is one author who is abbreviated. So that's a hint, this is a botanical name. I found the original publication by Tor that describes this species. Actually, it's devoted only to this species, so it's a pretty good read. I'll link it down below in case you're interested. Finally, let's discuss the most controversial part of the scientific names, their pronunciation. From my personal experience, there are many people who hold back from using scientific names because they're unsure about the correct way to pronounce them, and that's just so unfortunate. Naturally, you'll tend to pronounce the scientific names based on your native or default language. I'll give you myself as an example. Since my native language is a Slavic language, I would pronounce this name as Digitalis Lutea. However, speaking in English, I would probably say Digitalis Lutea. Both versions that I just demonstrated would be perfectly understandable, especially to people within the field. There are many guides out there that present the correct way how to pronounce the scientific names. And even though they might be helpful, they are usually based on the language that they're written in. So it would be more like an American way of pronouncing scientific names. Or Czech way to pronounce scientific names. And that leads me to another major issue. Even though the majority of scientific names are based in Latin, they are not all Latin names. Sometimes the names are taken from another language, or they're simply a Latinized version of someone's name. The most important thing, in my opinion, is to just say it. Try to pronounce the scientific names even though you're unsure about the correct way to pronounce them, and I promise you that more you use them, more comfortable you'll get. I really hope this video was helpful for you. And if you have any additional questions, please ask them in the comments below. Huge thank you goes to my Patreons, who support my work. And if you would like to become one and support me, please consider joining my Patreon or become a YouTube member. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.